this is a really great meeting. It's the highest signal to noise ratio that I've ever experienced. So thanks to the organizers for uh, organizing this. And, uh, so I, I, I thought about what am I going to say, and there's all this other stuff. Normally, everything that got, got said before, I kind of touch on these issues as well. I guess everyone else does as well. So I kind of thought, well, uh, what am I going to talk about? And what I'm going to talk about is, first of all, I'm going to start off with a couple of conceptual points that I thought about over the last couple of days. And I'd, I'd just like to clarify my position on those, just for potential debate. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some experiments we've recently been doing. Now, just to recap, I mean, this title is kind of a little bit too generic, I realize that. So, the way we entered this field was we studied these classic free choices that philosophers would consider random choices. Um, and um, people are not on a chair, but they're in a scanner, and they're deciding between left and right button presses, and then when they make their decision. And I'm just going over this very quickly. And we see that there's predictive information several seconds before they make up their mind, and if my signals in the prefrontal cortex, prior cortex, so no, that's not the randomness potential, that's something else. Um, but the predictive information isn't that high, so we can talk about that as well in a minute. Um, then you can get these predictive signals also for other kinds of uh, decisions, so this is a decision to add or subtract numbers, and <clears throat> so it seems to be kind of repeatable across different stimulus conditions. And there's lots to say about kind of ruling out confounds of these studies, but um, one typical question is always, could they have been decided, just deliberated all the time about their upcoming choice? And I think this is one of the best pieces of evidence against that. <clears throat> it just shows that the resting state network um, is high during the period where there is this predictive information. So if you can predict a choice several seconds ahead of time, it's not the case that the brain is in kind of like on an on-task mode, but it's in an off-task mode. And that actually matches what a lot of people uh, report after the experiments, so they kind of, they're kind of doing more prospective memory kind of tasks that they kind of, you start a trial, they kind of think about all sorts of stuff, and they think, well, now I'm going to have to make my decision. And so it's kind of this typical in the scanner, um, mind wandering situation, I think that's what they're in. But, that's another question. <clears throat> I'd like to touch on what I consider a couple of confusions in the debate, and I'm very happy to be educated, um, so I see this as my possibility to say this is what I think, and to be corrected if I, some of the things um, I say are, are, you, you disagree with. So let's start with a couple of these points. So the dual agent fallacy. I've always hated these kind of arguments by philosophers, sorry. <laughs> but. Um, this is my take on that. So, um, oh dear Thomas, my pesky engine is driving me mad today. Careful, Percy, otherwise a philosopher might accuse you of making a category error or a double agent fantasy. I think we perfectly understand what Percy is trying to say here, and it just means that we kind of refer to things in different ways, like the evening star, morning star, um, uh, and it's, it's a similar way. It's just like evening star and morning star, just where the evening, you say half the morning star and the evening star. We talk about different entities. So I, I don't think this is a problem at all. Um, another question is, is long-term prediction of choice outcomes across several seconds surprising? No, of course not. And why not? For example, this is published work, just random. Um, brand preferences. People have strong, stable brand preferences across long periods of time, like coffee or tea. You can predict that across several years. So there's actually no question that we should be able to predict choices across long periods of time. Um, do we need to include motivation and reasons? I do think it's very interesting to study decision making with motivation and reasons. And in fact, we've done this. This is just a couple of uh, pieces of work from our own lab. And, um, so we can predict choices for cars, we can predict choices for political parties, we can look at kind of random self-regulation situations, and in all these cases you can predict ahead of time, even in the absence of brain signals recorded in the absence of awareness, which choices people are going to make. So there's nothing surprising about this at all, uh, and there's, I just like to say, there's lots of research on this aspect of motivation and reasons. But I think there's a little bit of a fallacy here, I mean, I think 
philosophers tend to redefine this concept of free will in a way that not, doesn't capture lay intuitions. And um, we've done some experimental philosophy on this, which basically, I don't like to call it, what's I call it? opinion polls in the general public. Um, but what we find is, so this is work with Robert Deutsch and Michael Pound, who's a philosopher in Berlin, um, that if we give people kind of uh, get to rate agents in certain scenarios where there's like uh, choices between equal options versus real differences or an action has a consequence versus it doesn't have a consequence then the lowest perceived freedom is for choices between different alternatives so when there are differences and when there are real consequences that's what they consider the least free um, so there's um, an intuitive um, explanation for this well, let's say you're standing here, you might think, well, it's kind of, I have a degree of freedom that I can control. Whereas most people wouldn't say that they have a degree of freedom when it comes to this. They consider a situation like this when you have two options and one of them involves a big pot of money and the other doesn't. They don't feel free in this situation. They feel they have to go for the money. And obviously they have reasons to do so. And I think this directly translates to situations like this, coercion. I think it's no different coercion than the situation where you're offered lots of money. It's a perfectly rational choice that you try and avoid being shot. And it's a perfectly rational choice to go for the money. But in both of these cases, you don't feel free. Then, another um, conceptual issue is, oh well, um, there's no free will in the limit experiments. Um, they give up their free will when they participate in the experiment. That's what's relevant for free will. Well, we can study prospective intentions as well, so we can predict people's intentions to do things in the future. And if we do experimental philosophy, again, it turns out that, I'm not going to go into details about this, but what matters for perceived freedom is the proximal, not the distal intention. It doesn't matter what you wanted to do yesterday, as long as you want to do it now. If it, it, it's completely irrelevant. So basically the three different curves here are overlapping. Those are the proximal intention differences, but the, uh, the distal intention differences. The proximal intentions was driving these effects. And another confusion is freedom is necessary for responsibility. Um, I'm not saying you can't technically define these terms in a way to make that the case, but this is what we did with Till Fierkamp on his inspiration. He kind of said, oh, I can't, uh, that just can't be true. Let's try it out with responsibility. So we did, and it turns out that responsibility and freedom respond very differently to manip manipulations. For example, here, um, we vary whether people behave spontaneously or whether they deliberate what they want to do. So if you compare a spontaneous choice, so these are freedom ratings, that ratings that's in grey, uh, in, 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 in white, and the responsibility ratings are in grey, people consider if you start deliberating, it makes you more responsible but less free. So, just to be clear here, there's something wrong with this idea that freedom is necessary for responsibility. Um, at least in a graded form, this doesn't really seem to work. And um, so finally, another couple of conceptual points here. Um, and you can see this kind of flying by, so I apologize for the speed, but I, I just want to get these, these ideas out there. So what are the explanations for early predictive brain signals? Now, this is now a philosophical point. This is like a neuroscientific or technical point. Well, I think one is deterministic. You could say, if the brain starts changing its activity seven, seven seconds before you choose, well, this is a deterministic process, like a chain of dominoes just folding one by one. Um, and that we can't measure it properly because our scanners suck, which they do. Um, probabilistic version is, oh, it's just a bias. Uh, we can only partially predict in principle. Um, then there's an account uh, that I'm going to go into um, uh, that I consider important fluctuations and the accumulator will. I'll just briefly touch on this, just to kind of bring out kind of differences and similarities and positions among people here in this in this group. So this is my, when we started doing these choice predictive rates, this is the way I thought about the kind of challenge model um, to uh, the choice prediction. Um, so I thought, well, let's consider people when they have to break the symmetry between different choice options. What they do is they just go and open a box and look at the state of the neuron in that box. And this is metaphoric, obviously. Let's just say, this is a simple twilight. So what they're going to do is they've got this box in their prefrontal cortex, and then they look in there, and they say, well, if this neuron 376 is in a high state, I'm going to choose left, and if it's in a low state, I'm going to choose right. You're breaking the symmetry between these options just by looking at this neuron. So that's why you can classify it. But 
Why can you classify ahead of time? It's very simple. Brain signals are autocorrelated in time. So we know that if the brain signal at this point in time is high, it's quite likely that it was high in the preceding times as well, all the way back several seconds even, depending on the brain signal you're looking at. So you could perfectly well be setting the system to make the decision now, but still have predictive information from previous states simply because the previous states are correlated with the current state. Now, this is a little bit different than what Aaron thinks, and I'm raising it here because I think um, uh, uh, kind of, uh, we've been discussing this, and I think, kind of, kind of, I think we, we agree more than we differ. Um, but I think this is, this kind of, this is like the, the simplest possible toy model of making a decision and explaining predictive signals uh, that I can think about. And um, I also would like to point out um, uh, why I think that the accumulation of background noise is isn't so relevant. And we've, I mean, this, this is now more contrasting than it might appear, actually, because I think Aaron and I agree on a lot of points. I think it's just kind of to, to clarify the space of the debate. So, um, one thing is, I have a strong aversive reaction to accumulation, because I think accumulation is a habitual response of psychologists and neuroscientists to decision situations. And it's based on the fact that we have mathematical models for pressure for, for reaction time distributions, and we have some data in monkeys suggesting processes of accumulation under very specific conditions that are you can only be solved if you accumulate information where the information is distributed across time. I think in most situations we don't need to accumulate. We can just take a couple of spikes. I think this accumulation is, is a complete fetish. And interestingly, now the data is coming out that suggests that this might not be quite as it has seen. For example, you can lesion private cortex, the supposed uh, accumulator area, and you can still happily behave, the monkey still happily behave, and you can explain these ramping signals in accumulator models simply with stepping models so at the different points in time. So the accumulation account, I think, is kind of really taking a nosedive at the moment, and it's not generic, it's, I don't think it's a generic approach to decision making, I think it's being almost sold as such. Well, I'm happy to say that if you tilt it down and say it's something to do with averaging or something like that, then it might, might, might be okay. And another point is that um, uh, I think um, the, um, um, uh, there are some aspects in our data that are not compatible with the accumulation. So for example, one aspect is if you look at the um, times people take in these experiments before they make their choices, you predict, if you're saying that that kind of has a direct relationship to the redness potential, that then you get different redness potentials and different waiting time distributions. And from my understanding is that there is some data here like this, and there's other data. So I guess what is going to come out of this is that it might need a little bit more of an extension to um, explain the um, uh, uh, these differences, and similar to the adaptation that I think Aaron made with, um, with Patrick to account for the findings that they have, I think it might be necessary to either adapt the um, accumulation uh, process here or kind of uh, uh, think differently about this. So um, in the last six and a half minutes, I'd just like to say um, uh, how we approach this topic, and it's got nothing to do with randomness here at all. Um, and that is the question, what does it mean if you have a choice predictive brain signal, um, say a few seconds before you make up your mind, you have a, a series of events, and um, I think it's like a domino chain, and I think the reason a lot of people believe this is meaningful, the limit experiment is meaningful, because it suggests that there's a deterministic process or a ballistic process. You start it, it happens outside of your awareness, from some kind of unconscious brain process, it gets going and then it kind of determines or causes your ultimate decision. And we've been looking into this question about whether really this is true. And obviously, if you think about a choice predictor across seven seconds, if you tell the person to stop the experiment, they're not going to make the move. So it's quite clear that some things can happen in the meantime to stop them making their choice. We're going to do this on a shorter time scale. Um, so the question is whether we can terminate this causal chain here. We challenge people to do this in a scenario where, uh, like a shootout game, 
And um, the idea is we're trying to get people to break the causal chain between their uh, readiness potential they elicit, in this case we're doing EEG, and um, the subsequent movement. So the idea is in a shootout scenario, you, you have the um, opponent here and he's trying to, to draw, and you're trying to draw, but the idea is if you're trying to draw, you're going to elicit a readiness potential, and if the opponent can see your readiness potential, he might be able to use that to his advantage. So we're doing this now with um, EG, with an EG brain computer interface set up, and in this experiment you have a button and uh, a light, and the challenge to the people is to press the button while the light is green, then they win a point, and if you press the button when the light is red, then you lose a point. So if you do this, then you won a point, and if you do this while well, the light is turned red, you still press the button, then you've lost the game. And um, of course, the way this game works is that you have an online detection of the readiness potential, and what you're then doing is you're eliciting the red light. So you're kind of, oh, he's just about to move. Now I'm going to try and challenge him to stop. Yeah? And if he can stop, he has control over the processes during the period of the readiness potential. And if you can't stop, then it's a deterministic or ballistic process that's just running through. And um, so, if you to explain this experiment takes a whole hour. It's very complicated. And I remember that we had some very uh, generous input from some uh, very uh, benevolent and uh, insightful reviewers when we wrote this paper to help us make it uh, understand what we really found. But so let's assume that you have a readiness potential you're eliciting here um, and um, the, the classifier can pick this up. So now, how can you solve this challenge about not being predictable? One way is you could just suppress the readiness potential, uh, or another way would be you can just simply abort. So that would mean the, the readiness potential starts, but if you can't suppress it, the classifier will find out. So another way is that you simply start the readiness potential, but you might, there might still be an exit. It might not be a dominant deterministic process. And so what we see is that the first model doesn't seem to hold true. So when people are challenged to avoid prediction versus they're not challenged, they don't have to avoid prediction, the readiness potential doesn't really change. It seems that the readiness potential is something that's incredibly fixed. You can't do very much to, to, to change it. But what we see instead is um, that this is making a long story short, but um, people can, if you measure the readiness potential and you elicit a stop signal, but people seem to be able to stop their movement until a very late stage in this process. So you kind of detect all they're about to move, but if you do this early enough and you elicit a stop signal, then people are uh, still able to terminate the movement, so they have control over the process in this period. Whereas if you come too late, within the last 200 milliseconds, and um, then uh, it seems that there's a point of no return that you reach. And I think, uh, again, to highlight the commonalities rather than the differences between Aaron and myself, I think this is, this is part of what's really interesting is what happens in these last two, 300 milliseconds. So um, that's the... Um, uh, 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 an experiment that just highlights that when we think about causation, we need to show much more than just temporal precedence, and we're all aware of this. But the question is often, how can we actually do this? And in this case, we did it by just challenging people to kind of see if they can break the causal chain. And finally, I'd just like to say, what does neuroscience, what does it tell us about free will? Well, I think, so my key aspect here is so this is going to be. 30 seconds and I'm done. Um, I think what it shows is that intentions are represented in a way. I think that's the key contribution we can make. What we can do is we can say, well, when you make a decision, that is a brain process. And what this helps against is against all this terrible, more or less uh, latent or manifest dualism that people have. And it's just absolutely unbelievable. I give a lot of talks on brain reading, so extracting thoughts from brain signals. And you go to lay audiences and you say, you just make up your mind if you want to lift your left or right hand. Do you think I could, in principle, somehow read this out of your brain? I say, no, no. So I'd say at least half of the people say no. So there's this dualism that people have 
I mean, we all know this in this, in this field, but as scientists, we have that as well. So I think the big contribution of neuroscience here is to just locate the attention to the brain and convince people that dualism isn't true. And all the causal work, I think, is done through inheriting the laws of physics, the laws of, so they exist, of physiology, etc. I don't think that neuroscience has that much other to contribute to this than simply locating the attention to the brain. So thanks very much. Thank you.